How do you define success? You've probably thought about that at some point in your life, one way or another. Uh, you know, different people have different views of it, probably in our culture, uh, money, power, peer approval, job advancement, uh, certainly could factor into that. The newest, shiniest, the most expensive, uh, the prettiest, most influential, perhaps the most envy. Uh, you know, our culture is like with many nations, often has some mixture of these things uh, in order to elevate the achievers to the top of the pedestal. Uh, to receive the, I want to be the Joneses that everybody else on the block wants to be like type of mentality. I want to be the alpha males, the lead dogs, the overachievers. You could mix in top banana, head monkey, and any other thing that happens to come to mind. The consideration for the Christian, however, is not mankind's definition for success, and neither uh, is it how you feel about the issue, but the issue really should be, uh, what does the Bible say on the subject? As you might expect, if you examine it, God's perspective is markedly different from the philosophies of men. Today's text begins in verse 37 of the 12th chapter of John, uh, and we're going to do our best to cover these, but I believe that the first part of this, and it is broken into two distinct uh, subjects as far as what is covered. The first portion of this, I believe, uh, does contain one of the saddest and most tragic statements the Bible records uh, in, man, in mankind's realm. Quite early in our study of John's gospel, as we went back not quite a year now to chapter 1, uh, we found in verse 11 of chapter 1 that Jesus, speaking of Christ, came unto his own, speaking of the nation of Israel, came unto his own, and it tells us that his own received him not. They rejected him. In verse 10, if you flipped back and went back one verse, you will find that he, Christ, was in the world. The world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Wow. The creator of the entire universe, the most powerful being that has ever or will ever exist, that created the world, mankind, and everything therein, clothed himself in flesh and walked the earth that he had created and the creation refused to accept him. And that's what knew him not means. It doesn't mean they were ignorant. It means they recognized his claims and the reality of his presence and said, we don't want any and closed the door. Verse 10 speaks of that being the creator and men being not only unable to fathom God in the flesh, but that Christ was walking in their very midst, the Messiah, the promise of the Old Testament, because verse 11 narrows down the parameters to being the promised Messiah, okay? Deity, God in the flesh, the God man. And the fulfillment of God the Father's promises, down through the thousands of years of man's history. The nation of Israel, because he came unto his own, the nation of Israel's response was, we have no king but Caesar. Wow. Sad verses, aren't they? In John chapter 12, we come to find out what Israel and the entire created world system spiritually failed to recognize deity in its midst. Read with me, if you would, follow along beginning in verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, quote, Lord, who hath believed our report, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed, end quote. That is, by the way, a direct quote from Isaiah 53, the very first verse of that chapter. Now, verse, 38, or verse 39 goes on and says, Therefore, 
They could not believe because that Isaiah had also said, God hath blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted that I should heal them. That is basically verse 10 of Isaiah 6 that Tim brought to us uh, in our scripture reading just a few moments ago. These things Isaiah said when Isaiah saw God's glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, he said, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Wow. Okay. Sad verses, aren't they? Sad verses, tragic verses, when you talk about the inclusion of eternal destiny being either with God or in the eternal lake of fire. Christ's miracles were plenteous, this passage tells us, and authenticating, but most of mankind still questioned and said, give us a sign, give us a sign. Okay. The Old Testament prophets were quoted. Verse 38 is a direct quote uh, you know, of Isaiah 53, and then we've already mentioned chapter 6, verse 10 of Isaiah. Okay. Recorded in this passage, because it, the leaders represent the nation, is the national rejection of Christ as the promised Messiah. National unbelief, you can probably draw parallels with our own country and with most cultures throughout the world and its history. Ample evidence, the I am's. I mean, that's what John focuses in on, was the I am statements. You know, uh, we still got a couple to go, uh, but already, to this point in the chronology of the Gospel of John, you have multiple statements where Christ has done the miraculous. He fed the 5,000, turned water into wine. Oh my goodness sake, raised Lazarus from the dead. You know, the miraculous healing at the pool of Bethesda and so forth, you know, with more to come in all honesty. Uh, but here you have you know, I'm talking about the I am statements, but the miracles that went with the I am's, those are the main ones that are there. Uh, ample evidence. So why the rejection? My goodness, why the rejection? Well, verse 39 through 41, if you look at that briefly, can leave the impression that God, God blinds men so that they can't believe. Okay. See that? Yeah, take a look at it. This is one of these things that has troubled people over the years a little bit. Uh, verse 39 says, therefore they could not believe because, quoting Isaiah, God blinded the minds. That's Isaiah 6, verse 10. Okay. Yeah, God blinded their minds. God blind or their hearts, depending upon translations and which passage you're referring to. You know, and you say, wow, you know, uh, what about that? It's accurate. God does that. Okay. But you have to be careful that you understand the whole picture. This is one of those things that is a partial truth if you want to actually call it that. I know that's kind of misleading, okay? But it's true as far as it goes, but it doesn't paint the entire picture for you, okay? Now, we use that figure of speech, no, you don't see the whole picture, you haven't seen the entire picture. You know, that goes back to uh, ask anyone. I've, you know, been around uh, the Potter household with Daniel up there with his canvas and his paints out and whatnot. And he's got this picture in his mind and he's got, you know, part of a picture painted, you know, and uh, yeah, I can kind of tell the blues from the greens a little bit. Uh, but beyond that, I don't know where he's going with it. But the picture, the paint that is already on there is true, real, and accurate. 
but until he finishes the picture you don't know what the whole point is well likewise we can look at a statement like this and say well then god's to blame for men who don't believe so it's god's fault that men go to hell no that's does god harden hearts yes okay i'm going to give you some examples in a moment okay but how does that in fact take place is there more to the picture is there more pieces to the puzzle than just the three we have snapped together okay uh the question that we have to ask ourselves is how does a righteous god who never makes a mistake when he interfaces with faithless men who reject him how can he then bring a righteous judgment to bear without ever diminishing from his character of righteousness but still being just towards the unrighteous at the same time okay this is really one of the theological pictures that's here there's a sequential reality let me take you through some of this so you won't be confused first comes the faithless unbelief of men that choose not to believe we've already covered this but you can go back to chapter three for just a moment the subject matter the discussion with nicodemus in the garden everything that goes with it and verse verse uh, very clearly very clearly now we need to make sure that we uh, recognize what's going on here verse we all know verse 16 inside christianity right uh, if not, just watch a football game. There's a guy in the end zone with the sign. But anyway, verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay? That was the purpose of God taking on flesh and dwelling amongst men and going to the cross, not to condemn not to judge, if you want to use that word, but to provide a means to escape the certainty of judgment. There's a real difference between those two. Verse 18, he that believes on Christ is not condemned, but men that don't believe are already condemned because they, has not, they have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And then, by the way, please note here, we're talking about faith in Christ. We're just not talking about faith in God in general or faith in some God. We're not talking about faith in God the Father, per se, at this point, or faith in the Holy Spirit and claiming some type of a relationship you know, with Yahweh. That's not good enough. It tells us very specifically here, you have to have faith in the only begotten Son of God. Verse 19 says why men are condemned, why they are judged and ultimately cast into the lake of fire. Okay? That light, speaking of Christ, has come into the world. Men choose darkness. You might have the word love. It's the choice word for love. Darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. It goes on and gives even additional explanation as far as attitudes and heart, uh, you know, heart alignments and so forth. Okay? That is the problem right there, is that judgment on men come comes because they are faithless men. Verse 36, the end of the last verse in the chapter, says that he that believes on the Son has everlasting life. He that does not believe on the Son shall not see life, but God's wrath abides upon him, remains as an ever-present. God's wrath, judgment has already taken place. But there's a difference between the judge saying, guilty, hang him, and the guy actually being hung. There's a time lag. God judged the world, okay, in that sense, with the finished work of Christ on the cross. 
but it hasn't been executed yet that's not going to come until later more on that in a moment the lord reveals himself asking for a faith response if you're back in chapter 12 or chat into chapter 12 here uh i'll make a note of that in verse 38 okay it says who hath believed again quoting isaiah chapter 6 who hath believed okay have you paid attention do you know what's going on who hath believed that you know so the first reality is men have chosen the path of the rejection of god's truth and men are guilty of faithless living they are men without faith we call them unsaved okay true they are men without faith that's out of their choice that's the first thing that's happened God's revelation, God's revealing himself, whether it's nature through the morals and philosophies or directly through the word of God, through preaching and teaching, uh, is at this point isn't even the issue. God has said, I am there. How does man respond to that? We have no God but Caesar. In one form or another, that's exactly what happened. Okay. So secondly, now, men having already rejected by their unbelief the presence, reality, and truths of God in the universe, now God hardens their hearts and says, if you choose to do that, so be it. And that's what Isaiah 6 is all about. When you, We normally read, we, we either get off on the, the, the seraphim, uh, seraphim are essentially worship angels in the throne room, cherubim are the guardian angels, but that's, that's angelology. Okay. Or we deal about the, the, the call to service with the coal purging the, the sin so that he's fit for service, you know, in his role, Isaiah's role as a prophet. But if you get to verse 10 and following, all of a sudden you find that the heart of this nation has waxed gross that the nation, as a nation, has, this was back in Isaiah's day, 600 years before Christ, has rejected Christ because of unbelief. They've said, We're, God is fine, God is great, God is a, is a nice thing to have on the back burner if we need him, uh, but we don't want to go there. Okay. So God says, you don't want me? I will withdraw my presence. I will withdraw my blessing." I will let you go ahead and do things your way. And you know what results when we do things our way? We harden our heart. Okay. More on that in just a moment as well. That's what verses 39 and 40 right here in this passage talk about. They could not believe because having chosen a path of unbelief, God says, you want that path? So be it. So be it. Uh, then you will <laughs> reap what you sow. Note that God remains willing and able to take care of the problem of spiritual blindness and their hellbound destiny. But men must choose to believe God's promise. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not willing that any perish, that, but all should come to repentance. God's will, God's desire, is that all men would be saved, knowing full well that the huge majority of mankind will reject that. You say, well, what do you mean by reject? Unbelief is rejection. We often think of rejection eh, as... Uh, <laughs> Won't go there. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, picking up the really stinky socks left on the floor and dropping them in the burn barrel. Okay. We think of rejection as tossing it out through the window and getting rid of it. Okay. Uh, that's not really the complete meaning biblically in the scripture of the word rejection. Okay. Faithless is rejection. 
because being faithless is a choice you choose not to believe that's what john told her that's what christ told nicodemus in john 3 men choose men love darkness rather than light they choose having done so god says okay then i will let that play out and in doing so their hearts are hardened okay it uh verse 41 says these things said isaiah when isaiah saw god's glory that's isaiah 6 okay he's picked up and taken to the very throne room presence of God with the seraphim and the altar and the glowing coals, all that. That's what he's talking about in his context, all right? It, there's one that a lot of us have run into. If you haven't, you will, and that's the Pharaoh. When Moses was sent back down to Egypt to, to take Israel out of, the land, out of Egypt and to the promised land, it tells us that God hardened Pharaoh's heart absolutely true but it only occurred after pharaoh had already hardened his own heart go ahead read it check it out we don't have time to plow through the verses okay it uh you know what that harden means there in the old testament it's kind of interesting in the hebrew it means he trusted in the strength of his own heart Pharaoh heard through Moses what the God of Israel had told him was true. And Pharaoh went, I got my own way of doing this, dude. You know, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not backing down here. I'm, I'm the head man in all of Egypt. You know, I, I'm not going to waffle or compromise or, you know, anything with this God of these Israelite people. He hardened his own heart. He made a choice to not believe what God said through Moses. Having done so, in that doing so, he was choosing to harden his own heart. At which point God said, okay, then I'll make sure that your hard heart runs its course. And then God added to it. So turn to 2 Thessalonians for just a moment. We'll give you one that is going to occur in the future. It, uh, during what we call the tribulation period or the 70th week of Daniel, you find in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the Holy Spirit mentioned here as the restrainer uh, when you uh, look at verses 6 and 7, uh, talks about is removed from the earth. We call it the rapture of the church just as a label uh, type of thing. When the Christ comes back and takes his bride to be with him during that 70th week, the restrainer, the corporate presence of the Holy Spirit is removed from the earth. The Holy Spirit is righteousness uh, in spirit. He restrained. We're going to get to that in chapter 16 of John in some depth because Jesus talked about it at the Last Supper. Here, he's going to be taken out of the way and then the personification of the Antichrist, I'll put it that way. The wicked one, capital W in the old King James, will be revealed. It tells us what he's, he's going to be Satan, empowered by Satan, and the working of Satan with all false signs and lying wonders. And then verse 10, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that are perishing. That's present continuous tense, okay? because they receive not the love of the truth in order to be saved. And for this cause, God sends them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, okay? They chose not to believe what God said. They hardened their hearts because of that choice. I'm using that term. And because of that, a strong delusion, they climb right on board and right, right, right into the gates of hell. That's exactly what it said. Okay? God hardened their heart. Absolutely true. Just like he did Pharaoh. But man's personal choice took place first to reject the truths that are there. Turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 1. Probably as good a defining passage as you're going to find anywhere. Takes a while to go through it, which we don't have, so all you're going to get is some bits and pieces. It says in verse 23, 
after saying that all of the universe testifies of the of gods and his eternal power and mankind being without any excuse whatsoever because verse 23 says when they knew god they knew the revelation of god's presence in the in the universe they did not glorify and they weren't thankful they were vain in their imagination their foolish heart was darkened you could put in hardened right there real easily they professed themselves to be wise and became fools and changed the very glory of god into something that was corruptible unrighteous and wicked what happened because of that men looked at the evidence of god and then said we don't want any part of it we want to do our way on our terms and we're really proud of ourselves for coming up with an alternative hmm? sound familiar okay. so god it says verse 24 god gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their hearts god gave them up a little further down down here you say in verse 26 god gave them up and then again, in verse 28, God gave them over in the middle of the verse. As they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them up to a reprobate mind to do all manner of unrighteousness, including homosexuality. That's just one of the things that's there. Okay. They chose to say, we don't want what God's offers. And God said, okay, then I will let you run your own life and we'll see how that works out for you. Doesn't work well, does it? You look around at the horror stories and the tragedies, you know, look around at mankind, state in general, the national cultures that have walked away from God, including, I'm sad to say, our own, for the most part. And what do you see? Men in pride and arrogance saying, we know a better way. And they find themselves refusing to retain the knowledge of God at all. And so they wind up coming under the judgment of God because when all you have is men's philosophy to give you your life choices, you're going to wind up in a very difficult situation. I'll be polite about it. Okay? You really are. Does not bode for good. That human mind with no understanding of what objective morality objective good, objective righteousness truly is, is doomed to go exactly the other direction when he follows his own natural fallen instincts. That's one of the big problems with mankind is they don't recognize who, who and what they are as fallen men in this universe. You see, so back in John chapter, chapter 12, you find as the passage closes, the very following thing that is there, this little passage that we're talking about, the first of the two, how's that? Uh, I better get on the right page. It says, Nevertheless, verse 42 says, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. What kind of belief was that, you think? You know, we automatically conclude, and sometimes very erroneously, that we see the word belief and we think that the person saved. No. Belief has to have a contextual set of parameters. Belief can be purely intellectual. Belief can be emotional. Mm -hmm. Or belief can be something that is volitional based upon objective truth. I don't know. It kind of leaves us hanging. Were there some that were actually saved or did they just believe the miracles but not the vicarious sacrifice? Did they believe 
the water into wine? Did they believe the feeding of the 5,000? Did they believe the miracle of Lazarus? Intellectually, even medically, were they astounded at the miraculous? Were they in awe of the teaching? And then said, yeah, that we, we need to consider that. Was there faith? Biblical salvation faith in some? I hope so. But it kind of leaves us hanging, doesn't it, a little bit? Because you see, what is not mentioned here, you know, and probably at least a good portion of this is intellectual faith, but what is not mentioned here is confession. Romans 10 makes it pretty clear. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, in verse 9, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. A person who intellectually believes in Jesus but will not confess him before men, at best that's suspect. You don't have to quote me on it, quote Jesus. He said, he that confesses me before men, I will confess before my, my father. But he that will not confess me before men, uh-uh, I will confess him not before my father. Ouch. You know, I mean, we, we like the wriggle room, don't we? Uh, but Jesus kind of takes that away a little bit. The praise of men. You have to kind of wonder how many souls will burn eternally in the lake of fire because confessing Jesus is not the end thing. It's not the popular thing. It's not the politically correct thing. It's not the socially accepted thing. It might cause peer embarrassment. You might lose some friends, maybe even be rejected. You know, you won't get that cheerleader try out. You know, you won't get the next job promotion. You might lose some financial reward because you take a stand and say, I know Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. That may seem sound. It does because the unsaved world can't comprehend it. But that's still, that's what is indicated. It... Uh, you know, it's sad because deity walked through this created world, his created world, and the men that he'd placed in it. Did the miraculous signs he performed shouted his credentials? Okay. I'm the promised Messiah. I am the Son of God. I am the God man. Men's response? More concerned with short term peer approval than they were the eternal recompense from God himself. Right? Hasn't changed much, has it, in 2,000 years? That's a summary statement you've just looked at for the national unbelief of the nation, not individuals, though there were individuals that were among the elect, okay? but as far as a national group, Israel said, we have no king but Caesar. Okay? Now, to wrap this up, Jesus gives kind of a summary series of proclamations of himself and his ministry. This is taking place sometime between Palm Sunday and Good Friday, as we use the terms. Okay? So it's not Monday through Thursday, and actually Christ would have been crucified on Thursday, so Monday through Wednesday. How's that? More on that as we get to it. Verses 44 and 5 in John 12. So Jesus cried and said, cried from the sense of making a proclamation. Okay? And where was he? Well, we don't know for sure. Sometime during those three days, probably somewhere in and around the, the temple area of Jerusalem. He that believes on me, believes not on me only, but on him that sent me. And he that sees me, sees him that sent me. Okay. What exactly is he saying here? Deity manifested. He says, if you've seen and believed in me, Christ, Jesus, the Messiah, that is because I am equal in every essence. 
to God the Father, that is equal to believing in God the Father as well as believing in me. Okay? It, uh, see how this works. Go over to the book of Hebrews for just a moment, a passage that richly deserves a number of hours of your consideration. How's that? As the book opens, it says, God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in the past times, that's the Old Testament period, unto the fathers through the prophets, has in these last days, speaking of the biblical times of Christ, okay, spoken to us by his son, or literally in son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he made the worlds, now, ready for it, who, speaking of Christ, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, the outshining, we use the term effulgence, the direct reflection of the very Shekinah glory of God the Father. He is the express image. And because of that and everything that his what he was, by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. When he had by himself, you write that line in any English class and you will get red marked. Okay? You're guilty of using triple pronouns. When he had by himself. You can't do that in an English grammar class. God doesn't care about English grammar. He's trying to make him make a point. It is what Christ did by himself and only himself on the cross that purged our sins. And doing so, it was a finished and 100% completed work, so he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Power side. He sat down. He was done. He sat down as our whole book of Hebrews talks about him being high priest. High priest didn't sit down. Their work was never done. There was always somebody else sinning or some other event coming up or some other major holiday or, or something that required you to be busy, busy, going about doing, doing, doing. Why? Because mankind was continually sinning. The nation was continually sinning. The high priest's work was never done. There was no chair in the temple for him to sit on. Didn't need to be, because he was never done with his work. Christ sat down, so I'm done. You know, the whole book of Hebrews talks about that as well. He is the express image. He is everything in the flesh that God the Father in spirit is seated right now in the throne okay, in heaven itself. That's what he's talking about here. Verse 46, zoom along here. Verse 46, I am come a light into the world that whoever believes on me should not abide in darkness. He says it requires an abiding relationship, that meno word in the Greek, uh, to continue, to abide. It, it's very intimate, uh, very involved word in its complexity. He says, talks about providing spiritual light to men. He's talking about salvation, isn't he? being taken out of the spiritual darkness and translated in the kingdom of light, as Colossians 1.13 puts it. Abiding. 1 John 1 says, This then is the message we have heard of him and declare to you that God is light. In him is no darkness at all. And if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Yeah, what a passage. Do you know in Revelation 21, it tells us in the new Jerusalem, okay, future coming following the, the thousand year kingdom reign, the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and the new earth, there's no light in the new Jerusalem except Christ himself. He lights the entire city. Yeah. And it's only like 1,600 miles on a side. That's a lot of lumens folks. It really is. Idaho Power would love to have that capability. Yeah. In any case, we find then that in verses 47 and 8, talk about that judgment issue. Again, this is a summary proclamation. He says that Christ's earthly ministry wasn't provided by God in order to pass judgment upon men. It wasn't. 
He said, that's what John 3, 17, we've already read there. Remember, I did not come into the world to judge the world. He's talking about his earthly ministry. That earthly ministry ended with the satisfactory fulfillment of the cross and men's rejection of that. Okay. It is clear that men's, or that men's rejection of his earthly ministry wasn't the eternally damning point that was in contention. Okay. It is Christ's death on the cross and men's choosing to reject by unbelief okay, their faithlessness in that finished work of God's. Men condemn themselves. Okay. Yeah, men condemn themselves. Uh, we are called ambassadors of the reconciliation in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God, though was in Christ, reconciled the world to himself. Yeah. God did it. But you see, the rejection of God's truths, the eternal truths of his word concerning the necessity, absolute necessity, for men to choose to believe Christ's words. When the unsaved stand before the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennial kingdom, prior to the eternal state that is coming, when men stand there and say, but I don't deserve, I've never done anything really bad. The great white throne, by the way, I told, just as a reminder, is only for the unsaved to be judged. The saved, their destiny is already assured. The unsaved stand there, judged out of the, the, <laughs> the books of the dead, as Revelation 20 puts it. it uh, uh, they are going to say, we weren't really that bad. I wasn't nearly as bad as Bob. You know? And Bob said he was going to heaven. You know? But, and Harry was worse than Bob. And Harry said he was going to heaven. I'm better than either one of them. Well, compared to man, who's going to argue? I don't know. It, uh, but that's not the issue. It's faith in the finished work of Christ that is the issue. That is the gospel message. And men's unbelief in God's promises of an eternal destiny is the rejection of the truth that the cross presents to mankind. Verses 49 and 50 talk about the unity of deity in truth. He says, I and my, he was talking about that, that complete identity, that complete unity with the first person of the Godhead and the second person of the Godhead. And you're going to say, what about the third person, the Holy Spirit? Well, he hasn't been provided yet in the sense that you and I recognize today. Pentecost had not yet occurred. The Holy Spirit had not yet been given into the lives of believers. Was he present? Certainly, he was always God, but not personified in the, the normal sense that we understand. Okay. He says here that God the Father in heaven, God the Son on earth, okay, have a complete harmony in their will, the actions, the events, the outcomes of everything that has been done in the first 12 chapters of the book of John. So there are two main points in the text as we just present them for you. How's that? Out of the first passage, we find that Tragically, men are often more concerned with the temporal, temporal approval of men than they are of the eternal approval of God himself. Yeah, why? Unbelief. Mental assent, perhaps. Hopefully, some of those, those that we've mentioned went beyond just the mental, the intellectual. But the second thing is the very truth of God's love for the world manifest in the cross of Christ for men's sins. 
that will be rejected by the huge majority of mankind. Not from throwing it out the window, but simply not caring, not bothering with it, being ambivalent. Yeah, it's not, not an issue. I don't see where I need to deal with that. Well, I can deal with that later on, or well, that's not really important in my life right now. You know, you figure out how it goes. That is willful unbelief. You start down that path as an individual, and the huge majority of mankind has gone down that path, and as the path steepens, the unbelief grows, the Bible calls it the hardening of the heart. And God's removal of his presence allows that hardening to just pick up strength and pick up strength and pick up strength and just like Pharaoh, unsaved men harden their own hearts to relying in their own strength. You get the idea. Men condemn themselves by rejecting by unbelief. Unbelief is rejection. Well, I don't know about that. That's unbelief. That's a rejection. I don't really know if I can go along with that. Unbelief, that's rejection. Well, some people say, if Malcolm was here, I'd quote Malcolm, you know, uh, that's unbelief. That's rejection. Okay? Well, that's just your point of view. No, it's not my point of view. That's what God said. Okay? Well, I'm not comfortable with that. whoop de doo you're not comfortable with it. Is it true or not? Did God say that or not? Yeah, it's not an issue of personal comfort. The final execution of the judgment, it's like the judge in the courtroom and it taking hours, days, months, years before judgment is actually executed, that judgment will clearly proclaim unsaved men without biblical faith, hardened their heart to the eternal truth of God's love. That's what condemns them. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus. They choose to reject what I'm offering. In doing so, they condemn themselves. They harden their hearts. Their thinking becomes reprobate and becomes even more calloused and more difficult. And without God's grace, they are headed for an eternal hell. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for these closing verses in chapter 12. Kind of a, again, summary statement that is here, uh, that which kind of brings to conclusion the earthly public ministry of Christ. Uh, Lord, yes, we have the final instructions to the disciples, the apostles, uh, in the next several chapters. But this draws to a close all of the ministry that was performed in the sight of men in the land of Israel 2,000 years ago. So, Lord, we just lift these things up to you that we might recognize them clearly. Lord, live them as we act upon them in Christ's name. Amen.